WWE is a very silly place, and it's been home to a great many silly characters. Undead spirits, cult leaders, mounties, evil evangelical priests, whatever the hell Beaver Cleavage was. What are you, Beaver Cleavage? Are you an... like an incest... boy? Awful gimmicks come and go, and more often than not, a wrestler being saddled with a terrible look wasn't in that good a position to start with. However, sometimes the wrestler was absolutely fine how he was, even great, and they changed him into something truly wretched. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com, and here are the 10 worst image changes in WWE history. Number 10. The Undertaker. A slightly controversial one to start with, there are many people out there who, looking back, like The Undertaker's American Badass run of 2000 to 2003. Undertaker was over as hell and no amount of limp biscuit could truly kill off his fan base. but the dude went from looking like this to looking like this. At Judgment Day 2000, after an absence of eight months, the dead man returned on a motorbike, wearing a bandana, denim and being 60 pounds overweight. In hindsight, the run wasn't too bad thanks to Taker's innate charisma and also the fact that he slimmed down and became a better worker after half a year, but for the first few months, the general consensus was that the biker look was a big step down. In 2004, Undertaker returned to the dead man gimmick for the last and greatest stretch of his career. Number 9, Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes was one of the greatest heroes of the NWA. In the mid-80s, the matches he had with Ric Flair and the Horsemen were legendary. In 84 and 85, he headlined back-to-back -back Starcades with the Nature Boy and during his time with the company won the NWA World Heavyweight Championship three whole times. When he arrived in WWF for the first time, they put him in polka dots, teamed him with Sapphire and made him shuck and jive. Mmm. Many believe that the radical image change was designed to humble Rhodes, remind him that while he may have been the man in NWA, in Vince's ocean of muscly motion, he was very much a small fish. Number eight, Lex Luger. The ooh, don't I look nice and stuff gimmick is tried and tested throughout wrestling history. Gorgeous George, Rick the Model Martel, the masterpiece, Dash and Cody Rhodes, and of course, Lex Luger as the narcissist. Now, personally, I never fancied Luger, mostly because there was a constant civil war between his forehead and the rest of his face, and the rest of his face had shoddy defense, but still, it worked for him. Sadly, midway through 1993, Luger was earmarked as the successor to Hulk Hogan and became an American hero, body slamming Yokozuna and becoming legally married to an apple pie. As a narcissist, he had some personality. As an American hero, he was just a vanilla knockoff with nothing to say. Number seven, Kane. Glenn Jacobs is no stranger to the image change. After all, he went through perhaps the most successful one in WWE history, from an evil dentist with bad teeth to the big red fucking machine. I mean, uh, big red f***ing machine, as in the swearing I used was for emphasis, not that he was a big red machine designed for f***ing. Sorry. Anyway, Kane went through a few image changes of his own, changing masks, losing masks, gaining masks, but none were quite so legacy dismantling as his run as Corporate Kane, aka Tipsy Grandpa. Look at those goddamn slacks. Corporate Kane was okay for some comedy, and sure, the mask Kane look that he ditched wasn't the strongest in history, but a slightly confused textile salesman is still one hell of a step down for the devil's favorite demon. Number six, Devon Dudley. When the Dudleys were separated in the first ever WWE draft of 2002, Bubba went on to wear shorts. That's a slight step down from the classic grey camo look. Devon, however, fell much, much further. He became Reverend Devon, the spiritual advisor to Mr. McMahon, who used to come to the ring to deliver not very good sermons to the crowd. You know, because Devon used to say, testify and thou shalt not mess with the Dudley boys, etc. Makes sense, put him in a suit, print money. I mean, sure, we got Deacon Batista out of it, but the image change was regarded as a pretty considerable Considerable failure with Devon and Bubba reuniting in Survivor Series a few months later, and the Reverend thing was scrapped. Number five, Albert. Why do a lot of people dislike Albert? I mean, sure, he wasn't amazing, but TNA was pretty good. Not that one. He was good in X Factor, and the A Train wasn't awful. He was a big dude with a hairy back who shouted a lot when hitting moves and did a nice line in Albert bombs. I mean, that's fine for a mid card monster. A Train parted ways with WWE in 2004, and then he went to Japan, where he found great success as part of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Then home he came to WWE in 2012 and oh dear, the man who'd last been seen as A-Train was repackaged as Lord Tenzai, who had Japanese writing on his face and who definitely wasn't Albert. Nope, no way, shh, he's Lord Tenzai and you will respect him. The fans soundly rejected the gimmick and Tenzai was reduced to wearing lingerie in public and then forming tons of funk. It's hard to say which of those is the most embarrassing. Number four, One Man Gang. The One Man Gang was good. He wasn't a world beater, but he had a fun run of squashing jobbers, being managed by Slick, helping to retire Billy Graham, being the last man eliminated in the first Royal Rumble, being in the WrestleMania 4 WWF title tournament. He had a good bunch of highlights there. Then, and then, 
And then, in 1988, he became Akeem the African Dream. Slick revealed that the one-man gang was actually African. He was from South Carolina. Slick said that Akeem was going to embrace his heritage and showed him dancing in a ghetto with tribal Africans. He was from South Carolina. He spoke in a, quote, black accent, dressed like this, and was from the deepest, darkest parts of Africa. This is Africa. This is Spartanburg, South Carolina. I don't care if Akeem formed the Twin Towers with the Big Boss Man, and I don't care if he was quite high profile after the image change. He was Akeem, the African bloody dream. Number three, Terry Taylor. Like Dusty Rhodes, Terry Taylor was an incredibly gifted athlete coming from an outside promotion, UWF this time, lumbered with an embarrassing gimmick that seemed to undo every accomplishment he previously had. Dusty managed to pull his off with sheer personality. Ain't no man alive able to pull off the Red Rooster. Yep, Terry Taylor, superstar of the UWF, was told to fashion his hair into a red mini mohawk and cluck and jive. WWE, you are actual bastards. Taylor had pretty much no success as a walking rooster, and despite changing his gimmick in other promotions, the red rooster shtick was so poisonous that Taylor was never able to truly be taken seriously again. Number two, Chavo Guerrero. So you know how Akeem the African Dream was offensive for a white dude pretending to be African? Well, it goes both ways. Chavo Guerrero Jr., a third-generation Mexican-American and member of the incredibly vaunted Guerrero family, changed his gimmick to that of a stereotypically white suburbanite, or a suburban white, if you will. His catchphrase was, if it's not white, it's not right, which might as well have been cribbed straight from the Ku Klux Klan coloring book. He used to hit people with golf clubs. It was shit. Sure, his caddy turned out to be Dolph Ziggler, but like Deacon Batista, it's not exactly proof of a good image change. And number one, Paul Burchill. Look, f you, I like the pirate thing. He used to swing to the entranceway on a rope. Yes, it was a naked attempt to piggyback off Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes, it wasn't befitting a man of Paul Burchill's talents, but still, Pirate Paul swung to the entrance ramp on a rope and his finisher kicked ass. Anyway, they took him off TV just before the first pirate sequel came out, Shrewd moved that, and when he returned, he was a bland villain with one key selling point. He had a sister, and they were super into each other. Yep, it was a wink, wink, don't say it out loud, actual incest angle, where the brother and sister would hold each other, call each other beautiful, and he would say, every brother likes to make his little sister happy. No. No, absolutely stop every single thing about that. The company turned PG shortly after and the whole thing was scrapped ASAP. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Tell us about it in the comments. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter here. I'm Adam from whatculture.com and I'll see you soon.